Hey there, and welcome to another episode of The Caps and Life, a podcast about how comics and pop culture impact life and society, and vice versa. Coming to you from deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Kevin. And from Indianapolis, I am Sean. Before we get started with this episode, please hit that subscribe button on whatever podcast platform you're listening to us on, and follow us on social media under the username at Caps and Life. You can also find out more information and past episodes at thecaptionlife.com. That's right. Hey, we've got a great episode planned for today. We're excited to have uh, a guest in here in the in the Caption Castle uh, to talk about uh, some. We're trying to talk about comics, um, and we've had this guest on the show before. We are extremely excited to have him back. It is Ibrahim Mustafa. He is an illustrator and an uh, sorry and an Eisner Award nominated comic book writer and artist. His work has been published by Marvel, DC, Image, Humanoids, Boom. Uh, Valiant Entertainment, Dynamite Entertainment, Dark Horse. If if they make comics, Ibrahim's worked for them. Uh, <laughs> and he is here to talk uh, tonight about his new graphic novel, uh, Retroactive. So welcome again to the show, Ibrahim. Thank you guys for having me back. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for coming back on. And Ibrahim, Abby, you probably remember, we always like to ask our guests who come on the show this question. And we know that we probably asked you this question the first time you came on our show. Um, and by the way, you're one of the few people that are returners of the show. So congratulations. Yeah. 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 I want uh, I want a, I want a five timers club smoking jacket by the end of this. Oh, well, now that yeah. you suggest that we got to do that now <laughs> Yeah. with the capsule life logo on the back of it and yeah. everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> we, we now have, we now have Ibrahim under contract for uh, three more episodes. Yeah. Well, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Which, if he uh, keeps pumping out amazing work, it's not going to be a problem to have him on every time. Oh, well, exactly. You. Yeah. <laughs> so, Ibrahim, we like to ask all of our guests, what is your comic book origin story? What got you into comics? Was there somebody that introduced it to you? And how has that led to what you're doing today in the comic book industry? Yeah. Um, my my father was from Egypt, and he read comics over there, right? Like the mm-hmm. the probably, you know, Silver Age stuff that was translated into Arabic and so when I was a little kid, he would get me Superman and Batman comics um, and, you know, rent me the the Christopher Reeve movies and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, my first comics, I, I always forget what issue it was. It was like Detective Comics like 628, I think. I want to say it was like a Marv Wolfman, Jim Aparo issue uh, with G- Dick Giordano inking. Um, I always I always call him Jick Giordano. It always comes out that way. Uh, <laughs> And then uh, John Burns Man of Steel number two. And that one came with an audio cassette that had like the voice actors and the sound effects and stuff. So that was oh, kind of cool. how I learned to read. I was probably, you know, four, uh, four or five, like kind of, you know, listening to the tape and looking at the images and stuff. And mm-hmm. um, So that really, you know, got me hooked on those characters. And then I was, you know, also a child of the 80s. So like the Ninja Turtles was a big thing for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, eventually it was like finding out that there were comics of those. Cause at the time it was, to me, it was like the yeah. cartoon and then the just, movie, the, so. just the cartoon, the Saturday morning cartoon. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, um, and then, uh, the X-Men cartoon is what really got me into comics sort of like on my own, you know, without somebody giving them to me, me going like, oh, there's, you know, there are, are comics, there are books of these characters. Um, and uh, so I was really into them as a little kid. And then, you know, as I got a little older, I kind of just found other interests not like I was like, oh, I'm, I'm into cooler stuff now. It was just different, like nerdy stuff. <laughs> like I got really into Mortal Kombat and the, so that I was always drawing Mortal Kombat characters and stuff. And um, and then, you know, I got really into like soccer when I was in middle school and then break dancing in high school. And then when I was like in the last couple of years of high school, Smallville hit the airwaves and I was like, oh, I always loved Superman as a kid. And now there's a show about him. You know, let me, you know, so I got into that and then. Uh, somebody gave me a gift that was like a, a book that was the complete history of Superman. And the, the covers were like old Siegel and Schuster era Superman mm-hmm. drawings. But uh, when you pull the dust jacket off, it had those same images, but as reinterpreted by Alex Ross. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, what is that? <laughs> like, you can do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can make them look like real people that, you know, I mean, I obviously I had seen them in, you know, Christopher Reeve and stuff, but like, to have this painting, you know, I was just like, Mm. what is this? So then I found out who he was and that led me to kingdom come. And then, you know, then I was like, became a fan of Mark Wade's writing and that led me to birthright. And then it was kind of just down the rabbit hole from there. And then, so 
it was like right after high school that I really got into comics and, you know, found there was a comic book store nearby and, you know, started reading stuff, opened a box. And then from there, it was like, you know, I always loved drawing. I used to draw these characters as a kid. And here I am now at this point, I'm reading like Criminal by Brubaker and Phillips and stuff. And, um, and I was just like fell in love with the medium all over again. And that, you know, made me go like, well, I want to take my ability to draw and, and like do this. So I started out trying to be the next Alex Ross, like painting and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I, you know, <laughs> and then I realized that like what was actually like the fun part for me was like not just the single image that would be a cover, but like telling the story from beat to beat. So then I just started um, seeking out like uh, comic book scripts online or like you can, you know, when you could find like a, a, a ultimate Spider-Man trade with the Bendis scripts in the back or something, mm-hmm. you know, I would I would practice pages from that kind of stuff. Um, and then it became like finding other people who are interested in it and teaming up to do a little like collaboration. Cause at the time I thought, Oh, well, I'm an artist. Like, and then there are writers, so I'm not a writer. So I'll, you know, um, and then eventually I realized it's not that binary. You can do both. And that's kind of, you know, how I got to where I'm at today, but Mm -hmm. yes, that's, that's the, 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 you know, short sort of like cliff notes version of it, but yeah. I want to talk about like 10 things that you mentioned in there, <laughs> but I won't just, just, I'll just pick one. So like, I loved drawing Marvel. I'm not uh, M- mortal Kombat characters when oh, I yeah? was a kid too. Yeah. Especially because like sub zero and Scorpion, you didn't have to draw their faces. Like they wore, <laughs> right. They wore masks. Yeah. Uh, that I rem- you said that and it like a light bulb went on over my head because like, I used to do the exact same thing. Like, you know, what's you know, funny you- about that is I picked like Luke Kang was always my favorite. And mm-hmm. he's like the hardest one to draw because not only you have a full face, but you have like a torso and arms that are exposed. Mm-hmm. So like you had to learn to draw muscles, you know, and mm-hmm. I've always been like that. Like uh, every project I take on, whether it's like one of my custom action figures that I like to make, or like I got really into customizing like vehicles for them now, or like making a comic. It's like, I'm always finding myself asking the question, like, why, why am I doing this to myself? Like why I always pick like, <laughs> the hardest thing, you know? That's probably but. the difference between like someone like you, who's really good at it. And somebody like me, like you challenged yourself to get better. <laughs> and I was like, I'm, I can draw sub zero. That's totally okay. <laughs> I don't need to draw like um, an abs or whatever. Cause you know, <laughs> the costume is in the way. Uh, and you're, and now look at you, that's where you're at. And, and I'm, I'm on the other side of the that microphone. Was, so. That's the, that's the point in the continuum where, Kevin either becomes a comic book artist or not. It's like, (laughs) does he draw the abs? Hey, fifth grade, sixth grade. Like it was, it was one of the things that was in the realm of possibility for me because I loved it. And it's the same, same situation. Like, you know, I loved Superman growing up and I, the X-Men cartoon had just kicked off then. And like, it was like, I want to do this. I I, I fell in love with comics around the same time. Um, I didn't nurture my talent the way that uh, the way that you. <laughs> well, did. that is so, really the thing with drawing, honestly. Like, because most kids are are pretty decent at it, or at least like around, like kind of at a similar skill level. Mm-hmm. And I think the difference is really just like, you know, does the one kid keep going versus the other kid like find something else that they're right. into? You know, practicing. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Kevin, we're probably about the same age, right? I mean, I'm I'm actually going to be 37 tomorrow. Yeah, and I'll be 40 later this year. Okay. Yeah. So, so we're well, here. happy early birthday. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Lots to celebrate. Yeah. Uh, Ibrahim, it's been a, about a year since we've talked. Uh, and in that time, you have written and, and drawn another original graphic novel. Um, where were you in the process a year ago when uh, Count came out? Where were you in the process a year ago with this one? And what does the timeline look like for you to put something together like this? I think with this one, when count was coming out, I had already, I had certainly already pitched it and had it approved. So it was like, okay, as soon as I finish count, that's the next one. I think, I don't know that I, I think I started writing it after count came out, probably like in April or May. I know the date on the script is like June. I think when I did the final draft, Mm -hmm. Um, but this one, you know, it's a pretty complicated, it's a time travel story. So there's a lot of like moving parts I had to figure out. So there was a lot of, you know, like back and forth and figuring that stuff out. So this one actually was a a, a longer process for me than uh, Count was. Like Count, I I had I had a very detailed synopsis and outline written because it was my first book with them, and so I you know, with humanoids. So you know, I kind of had to show them like, here's what I'm thinking because they, you know, I I had written some stuff, but I wasn't like known as a writer yet. So I think they wanted to make sure like a 
can he pull this off and be this guy's adapting like a literary classic like let's make sure it doesn't suck you know <laughs> so <laughs> mm-hmm. right. so but i had such a like thorough outline done that it was like i wrote the the entire 120 page script in like 10 or 12 days i can't remember one of the two um because it just was like falling out of my hands because i had already you know had it all figured out mm-hmm. uh retroactive took a lot longer and you know like i said there was a lot of like moving parts to figure out you know because you're dealing with like time travel and the logic of it and you know do these things layer on top of each other and you know do they work out well and then i've also got sort of like two parallel timelines in it that sort of converge at one point and so um a lot more moving parts and then this one actually took me a lot longer to draw just because you know, the pandemic hit and I was like helping my nephew long distance with his homework because he was doing everything from home at that point. And like, mm-hmm. you know, he's got attention issues. And so we were trying to get that dialed in. And and then, um, yeah, just like, a you know, I think it was a, a tough window of time for everybody. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, this I want to say retroactive took me about a year to finish. And with retroactive, because you were talking about how you wrote Count and that was inspired by the Count of Monte Cristo. Does Retroactive have any um, draws from any inspiration from other stories like this, or is this completely, you know, um, from your imagination and everything? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly inspired by my love of time loop stories. Like the the elevator pitch for this is James Bond meets Groundhog Day, right? So yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, you have the 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 repeating day aspect of it, but then also yeah. the espionage stuff that I love. So there's also a lot of like James Bond story structure influence in this. Mm-hmm. Um, I love, you know, how those open with like a, a, you know, big action set piece. And then, you know, you have like the villain reveal and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I, I structured it in a way that was, very like comforting and familiar to me because I love that, <laughs> that genre. Yeah. Um, so it was really just like kind of taking the two and mashing them together. Gotcha. Cool. Well, uh, during that time, you also did uh, Wastelanders Wolverine for Marvel. Uh, how did you, how did that come about and how did you squeeze that in with everything that else that you were going or everything else that you were doing? Yeah. Uh, that I just got an email from an editor of Marvel and he was like, Hey, I think you'd be a good fit for this. Do you want to do it? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. I love <laughs> you know, Wolverine. And, yeah. and, uh, you know, my schedule with retroactive was, um, you know, flexible enough that I was able to, you know, just say like, Hey, is it cool if I step away to do this for a month and then come back? And they were like, yeah. Um, cause it helps, you know, in general, like, uh, you know, you kind of have to do big two work to get, enough name recognition to where when you do a more indie type release, like retroactive, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's not an indie book in the sense that like humanoids is a big publisher, but you know, they're, they're more of a niche like publisher rather than like, you know, capes and cowls and stuff. So, right. um, So yeah, it just kind of helps with like the visibility, you know, get your name in previews and the comic shops recognize it from, Oh yeah, that guy did a Wolverine thing, you know? So then they Mm -hmm. might be more liable to, uh, take a chance on, you know, something that is like unfamiliar to them. Right. Right. Which by the way, I have that issue. I just haven't read it yet, Oh, right on. <laughs> but I have it. I have it sitting with like my whole, I have a huge two shelf stack of unread comics. It's just kind of sitting there. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to get to it, but I, yeah, no I saw the name on there. I was like, I, I've got to read this. I've got to read it. So I appreciate it. It was super fun, man. And Steven S. Denight, who, you know, was the the showrunner and I think head writer on Daredevil season one. Yeah, I was going to ask about yeah. that. Like, how was that working with him? Um, he's great. Like, just such a nice guy, super positive, fantastic writer. I mean, I read the script and I was just like, this is 100 percent like my vibe. You know, mm-hmm. it was like the beats of it, the the way he, you know, unwrapped some of the moments in it. Like, it was just totally the same kind of storytelling aesthetic that I go for so Mm -hmm. it was pretty seamless and it and it was a it was super fun and like yeah i'd love to i'd love to work with him again like he was just a great collaborator and then we had niraj menon i think is how you say his last name on um colors and they were just fantastic we actually collaborated again on a a doctor strange thing that's coming out next month oh cool yeah he was a he was a great colors to work with so yeah it was a it was a good time nice Um, so retroactive has some familiar beats in it, but it's a completely new and original story. 
Uh, can you give us a little bit more of a synopsis about, oh, sorry, I just hit my microphone. <laughs> um, can you give us a little bit more of a synopsis of what the story is about? Yeah, so uh, we follow uh, a an agent for the uh, Bureau of Temporal Affairs, which is like the CIA for time travel, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we it's kind of like a five minutes into the future story. You know, it's like, I think it's like 20 or 30 years from now. Um, and you know, time travel exists, but it's like a, it's a secret, you know, it's a government secret and like the five superpowers of, you know, U S China, Russia, Japan, and the UK have access to it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the, the similar, uh, party lines of like, you know, our allies are Japan and the UK and then Russia and China are doing their thing. And, and so, um, you know, when, if, if say the UK goes back in time, like, they have a specific time signature uh, that, you know, the other agencies can tell when it's one of theirs. Right. Mm -hmm. So these anomalies start showing up at the timeline that have no time signature. And so the main character Tarek is like sent to investigate it. Um, And that leads to him, you know, basically being stuck in a time loop by the bad guys and having to thwart the, terror attack that causes the time loop that causes the causes the day to restart uh so he can try to get back to his timeline and save the day Mm -hmm. cool now it's because you mentioned time loop and you you mentioned james bond versus uh james bond meets groundhog day Mm -hmm. it's got some it's got some familiarity to it and some of the some of the things that we've seen in time travel stories before but how do you come up with the rules of time travel that you're going to adhere to for a story like this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I you know, it was important that it be simple because mm-hmm. I think you can get really bogged down by like how does this work and and also I didn't want it to be like oh they just wear a watch, they touch and then it like zaps them out of wherever they are because that's too much of a like you know, MacGuffin thing, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's it's too easy. They could just, you know, so so it has to have enough rules to to like kind of hamper their progress right in a way that Mm -hmm. makes the story interesting otherwise they could just be like wherever they want right so um that was the main thing it was like the jumping can't be anywhere in time you can go to the destination point in the past and then back to the present and that's it right Mm -hmm. and you have to use these watches in tandem with this like what what i call a drift chamber Right. So, you know, and the drift chambers are located in specific places. So like, you know, at one point in the book, they have to go back to Dallas, right. For the Kennedy assassination. And mm-hmm. because that's like such a pivotal moment in American history, there's a drift chamber nearby. Mm-hmm. Um, other instances, like, you know, you may go back to that year and time, but you got to do some traveling to get to the actual destination. Right. So, um, I was trying to keep it as, as, uh, like grounded as I could with while still being like, you know, this fantastical thing of time travel. <laughs> right. I, I also wanted to like ask you too, cause I, we talked about this when you, when count came out, like the visual details that you came up with, like that, the, you know, and count the ships look like uh, the spaceships kind of look like whales right. and like how, how you come up with some of the technology. Um, I was fascinated with the future fashion that you came up with uh, like the suit and stuff that the Tark we- wears. Um, and then also the, um, the cell phone, like the communication device. That's like, almost seems like a um, like see-through uh, yeah, transparent like a, screen. Right. Because I read the book. Uh, I read the book on Friday. Uh, you, know, you sent it to us. And then this weekend, I also watched the new, um, uh the adam Adam project the adam project yes and their communication (laughs) devices like in the movie are like eerily similar oh that's the new ryan reynolds ones Ryan reynolds one right i meant i mean to watch that yeah and it's about time travel and he's got like a futuristic communication device that looks very similar to the one that's featured in in your book and i'm like (laughs) man like like he's got his finger on the pulse like he knows what what's going on but i was i was just (laughs) just curious about how you decide on things like that how a character is going to look and things like that yeah, I I try to look at like sort of the the way that that you know trends kind of come back, right? Like every you know, like uh more more tailored suits 
you know, more like like sort of like 1960s era, you know, early, late 50s, early 60s era suits have, mm-hmm. you know, are like more in style now, right? Mm-hmm. Like they're more tapered and, you know, thinner ties and stuff like that. Or maybe they were, you know, five years ago, whatever. So I kind of <laughs> tried to t- think about the the cycle of of when things come back in style and then sort of plan it out that way. But it's also, you know, I, the math may not exactly line up, you know, because it's mostly just like, well, I also like that aesthetic. Like I didn't want to be like, you know, oh, mm-hmm. the 70s are in style now or like the ugly early <laughs> aughts, right? Where everything is I was like, say, is there somewhere on the future timeline where like the big oversized suits from the early 90s? Right. Are, like, are <laughs> yeah. back in? Oh, it's already here. <laughs> double breasted and yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and and then you know, with with something like the phones, like I I was trying to think of okay, well, look, look, you know, how have they evolved from, you know, the old Nokia bricks and the the flip phones and like, you know, what would maybe the next stage of that evolution look like? You know, um, I did the same thing with the vehicles, like, um, you know, like Tarek's car is like a a mustang but yeah it's, it's like, beautiful know, I, too thank you yeah and, and i i kind of looked at like okay what did mustangs look like you know my favorite mustang is like 69 70 you know mm-hmm. like the mach one body style and i was kind of like what with the evolution of vehicles what would that look like it's going to be a little more streamlined you know maybe the instead of having like a um like a metal emblem it'll be like kind of a digital thing on the screen almost you know mm-hmm. uh, but then i kept the tail lights the same as like the three Mustang taillights, you know, just to kind of give those nods to it. And you can look at, you can look at that car in um, the grill, like the shape of the, the, the Mm -hmm. grill, I hit my microphone too, the shape of the grill and then the taillights and the, the circular emblem in the, on the trunk where the old Um, gas. Yeah. 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 You you can tell that that's a Mustang and it's amazing. Yeah. Thanks man. Yeah. And the the other thing too, and this is something I, I wanted to make sure I got right is like, when you see stuff that takes place in the future, like, every all the cars are future cars and it's like well not all the cars are modern now right so i wanted to make like our cars now be like kind of the old junkers of this book's timeline so you see kind of a a little bit of everything in between like some of the bad guys drive like a a current dodge ram right Mm -hmm. but in you know 20 30 years it's gonna be a little beat up you know they painted a camo and stuff like that Mm -hmm. um and then i kind of did like okay what would you know a lot of the cars i sort of made up um, like they're not really based on anything specific, but they look like they kind of belong, you know, sort of somewhere in between now and 20, 30 years from now. Right. Um, I'm one of the weirdos. I'm one of the few people I think that like loves drawing cars. So <laughs> for me, it was like, you know, the other car he drives, uh, the one he kind of steals with the valet ticket in the, when he's stuck in the loop yeah. is, is like a Lincoln continental. Yeah. And I, I sort of modeled it off of like the old ones, you know, that have the suicide doors like in the Matrix. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then also like, you know, kind of a newer, sleek version of it. And same thing with the sort of digital light up grill sort of mm-hmm. deal. So, yeah, I really love doing that kind of world building type of stuff where, you know, you, you try to make it look lived in, but also believable and, you know, mm-hmm. other than what we have now. I think you got a, I think you got a great thing going. You could do like a... um the cars of Ibrahim Mustafa like calendar and, <laughs> and put that together and do like a Kickstarter or something for it. Yeah. I'll, and, I'll Photoshop myself in yeah. closing on them. You, uh, should, I mean, you should grab the, the drafts of those and frame them and then just slyly send them over to Ford and be like, Hey, here's some car designs. If you yeah. want to talk, <laughs> I'll be like, what you used our stuff in your car, but no, no, I didn't. <laughs> uh, I was careful not to put any logos in. Right. Yeah. 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 Yep. Um, yeah. But the notes are there. You can, you can, it's, and it's great though. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's really good. Yeah. It's really Thank good. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and I, I have to share that going back to the Adam project and that happening like the same weekend that we were reading this book, I, there was a moment for me where I, I stopped halfway through your book to take a break. And then when I came back to it, I had just finished not only watching the Adam project, but having to write a review. And so I had to pay like close attention to that. So when I was reading your book, I got to be honest, I kept getting confused. I was like, wait, is that the rule in this book or is that the Adam project? Yeah. (laughs) So it it took me a little bit longer to read the book because I had to re-familiarize myself with the rules of time travel. So a a word to the wise, whenever you're reading any sort of book about time travels, make sure you're not also watching or reading another one that has its own rules for time travel as well too. The Ghostbusters (laughs) are right. You don't 
you never cross the stream never cross the streams yeah <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Um, so we, we've talked about, uh, to switch gears a little bit, we've talked about representation quite a bit on this show this year, and your book has a diverse cast in, in, in its entirety. And can you tell us a little bit about the process you go through when you're developing these characters and deciding how they'll be depicted in the story? Yeah. You know, a lot of it is just kind of like, I don't get to see myself in a lot of things. Mm-hmm. So like, let me do something that is representative of people like me and then hopefully other people like me will be like, ah, something for us, you know? <laughs> and I saw that um, in your, in your foreword, I think in the book as well too, which yeah. I thought was great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's uh, you know, I, I think one of the, one of the problems with like representation that we've seen a lot is like, you know, there's a lot of whitewashing of characters when things get adapted mm-hmm. and, you know, it doesn't happen a ton cause they're, you know, aren't as there aren't that many things where like uh there aren't that a lot of things to whitewash i guess right i mean there are but like you know um i guess you don't really see too many like like sin city gets adapted right like everyone is pretty much you know who they were in that book right Mm -hmm. um right and uh so yeah i just i guess i wanted to make a thing that like hey you know this exists for people and now that hollywood is kind of catching up if it does get adapted, then hopefully they keep it true to, you know, like the way the book is, because I feel Mm -hmm. like it starts with the source material, you know, and nowadays in Hollywood, obviously like a lot of graphic novels and comics get adapted. So, right. You know, this is just one more that like, hopefully would be if it, if it does get adapted, not that I made it to be a a movie or anything, but like, you know, it's something you have to think about when you're doing these things. Yeah. Um, and so my hope is that like, okay, well, you know, I guess that's what I'm trying to say is I'm, I'm trying to be the change I want to see in the world, you know? There you and go. So if I put yeah. it out there, then hopefully that's one more thing that, you know, gets peppered into the, the grand scheme of things and gives us mm-hmm. one more, you know, cause you, I mean, there aren't really like any middle Eastern or whatever, you know, like, uh, leads in this kind of stuff you know mm-hmm. um i mean a little bit with like there's there have been a few sort of um you know like spy movies that take place in the middle east that have had mm-hmm. protagonists um but it's usually like contingent upon where it takes place mm-hmm. right? yeah. like it's and so uh i wanted to do something that's like it's not even about his you know ethnicity or anything like it doesn't even come up other than just being right there, you know? mm-hmm. yeah um because it's so often there's like a reason they have to be this way you mm-hmm. know for the story and it's like no it could just be you know like a, a regular person who just happens mm-hmm. to be whatever they are you know yeah so and i i think that the book is actually very cinematic uh, and maybe that's because of the way that you like you said you formatted the story that the way that it opens almost the way that a James Bond movie um, would open. You got rooftops and everything. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, but that it is. But the, one of the things that I noticed was exactly what you said. Like this, the other thing too, is I'll compliment you on um, having um, hi- having him called Rick, like somebody else calls Tarek Rick. Yeah. Which, <laughs> which clarified you. how to pronounce his name. Yeah. What was it? Was it Tarek or was it Tariq or whatever? Right. Uh, mm-hmm. And that was, it reminded me of um, Shang-Chi and right. him, yeah. him saying it's like Sean, <laughs> but yeah. So like, well, I thought that know, was, was that, something... did you have that in mind? Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it it, it kind of works double duty. Uh, one for the reason you stated, but also people are always looking to give me nicknames, right? Mm-hmm. All, all you know oh do you, do you have any nicknames yeah i have several but you don't get to use them because you don't know me you know like <laughs> yeah, yeah like i had i had i you know i went to the doctor at one point over the last couple of years and the the person at the front desk was like uh do you have like she was really struggling with my name and then was like didn't even try to say it just read you know looked at it and like is that that moment of like freezing that like all my substitute teachers had when they got to the M's on the roll call, you know? <laughs> like, and, uh, and she was like, do you have a nickname? And I was like, no, <laughs> and then, you know, and I kind of joked with her. I was like, you know, 
we could all say how we feel about Daenerys Targaryen, right? Like, mm-hmm. so, yeah. you know, <laughs> Ibrahim, it's not really that far-fetched for people. Like, right. Um, so yeah, that, that was another part of it too, is I just, I, I wanted to give like, you know, I, I don't, I don't say it outright, but like the character is meant to be Egyptian. And it's a very Egyptian name that I gave him. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's kind of like, and 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 his partner, his new partner, Lucia almost, right? She's Latina. And so mm-hmm. she she kind of gives him that look when when their boss, who's his friend, you know, and they have that shorthand. He calls him Rick, and she kind of looks at him like Rick. And he's like, mm, you can do, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know how it is. <laughs> like, so yeah. Yeah. No, I, I the, love those uh, I love those poses that you uh drew in there though, because it does communicate a lot in terms of the the communication you know that you can really show without saying anything in that and i think we don't get a lot of that in the comics like we get a little bit but i remember reading this comic there are a lot of panels where there's just facial expressions or or body expressions that had no dialogue with it and i thought it communicated just as well as anything with dialogue too so i i think you did a fantastic job with this book and doing that that utilizing that medium to be able to visually express those things that we don't get to necessarily experience in other comics or books or things like that as well, too. So thanks, man. That's something I really enjoy is trying to really sell it on visuals when I can. Yeah. And that's one of the benefits of getting to write and draw my own stuff is like, if you're working with a writer, they're going to see that and they're going to be tempted to add a line to go with that facial expression. Right. You know, and, and I think it doesn't need it. So I've mm-hmm. had that happen in collaboration in the past. And you kind of go like, you didn't have to do all that. Like it was all there, you know, because yeah. a lot of times that won't be in the script. It'll be something that I would add as the artist. And then they go like, oh, and do, doing the lettering pass. And then they add dialogue. And I'm like, right. Do all that. So, <laughs> so it's nice to have the freedom to just let the moment play out the way that it, you know, happens in the panel. Yeah, and I thought it was great, honestly. Like, I, I agree with you. I didn't think it needed any more than that because the expressions nailed it very well. So, thank you, man. Yeah, and I, I, I from the from the jump, like one of the things that I always talk about when people say that they don't like different like runs of superhero comics, a lot of what we know and love about like the superheroes that we um, idolize, it's 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 the story that a specific writer is telling. That's not Superman that you don't like. That it's. Um, you know, it's whoever was writing that time. Um, and I thought it I thought it was exceptional that you th- kind of looked in the mirror to find your your hero for this story, um, because because I, as soon as I started to get into the book, I, I realized that that's kind of like like you put a lot of yourself into this. Um, maybe not the way that, you know, that he acts or behaves. M- maybe you are super heroic like like that, but definitely like <laughs> um I felt like his his backstory, like like you said, that he is a very Egyptian character, and and I think that has a lot to do with the way his relationship with his family mm-hmm. in the story plays out. Like you can definitely you can definitely see that stuff. Thanks, man. Yeah, I wanted it to to read authentically, you know, and and there's definitely little little bits of personal stuff in there that I think you know you just kind of have to do when you're writing any story to make it really connect with people, and then you know, other stuff that is kind of extrapolated from, you know, either personal experience or people I know or whatever, you know, just sort of sympathetic scenarios. Like, you know, um, his, his mom in the book has dementia and, you know, she has to like, there's a, there's a sequence where they're going to tour like a, like an assisted living facility Mm -hmm. for her. And, um, you know, I, her her dementia plays into the general like the overall story in the sense of like he's trapped in this loop for however long you know like is what is that going to do to his mind is he is he having early onset signs of it is it is it you know genetic is it uh mm-hmm. and then also like he's got to get back to his mom you know because he doesn't know how long relative to his own time he's gone while he's in this loop and stuff so i really wanted it to have those personal stakes so that you you know, have a reason to really care about him and like why he has to, you know, break out of this. And just like, I think anytime uh, a character is sympathetic in that way, like, because not everyone, you know, nobody who reads it is going to be a, a a time spy, but people who read it have family, you know, or like mm-hmm. maybe a sister they don't get along with or a, a, a parent who needs their help or whatever. So I think when you put that kind of stuff into the story, it really gives people a reason to care about the characters. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is completely revolutionary what I'm saying right now. Nobody knows. <laughs> <it>. <laughs> um, Ibrahim, this is book two of a three book deal you have with humanoids. You touched on it a little bit earlier. Uh, can you tease at all what you're doing next or you have, which you have any ideas for your next story or is, is that something, uh, that's something you gotta keep close to your chest. And do you ever, do you ever see yourself working on something that's like serial or continuous? Cause I noticed like the, the last two things you've done are, are in this nice little, um, package with the beginning and mm-hmm. an end. And yeah. So, you know, to all answer the second question first, I would love to do something serialized. Um, it's, it's tricky because like, you know, depending on the publisher, like, like humanoids, isn't really like a monthly comics Mm -hmm. publisher. They're more of like a, you know, collected edition or like original graphic novel place. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I love telling stories in that format. I love that you, like you said, it's a nice package, right? Like it's, it is very, I mean, I like to tell these stories cinematically because I really enjoy that experience of like you know, especially when time is limited and, you know, I mean, Sean, you mentioned like having a, a big to read pile, right? Like, and it's right. probably full of single issue stuff for the most part, you know, like a, a bunch of stuff. And then Kevin yeah. sent me some stuff for me like <laughs> last year. I'm just like, I, I don't need more stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, it's the single issues for me are always the easiest thing to let pile up because, right. you know, then you are like, Oh, I got to reread that issue. Cause it's been two months since I had a chance to read it. And I don't remember what happened yep. in the last one. So I really enjoy that that um, experience as a reader of like like I'm I'm absolutely loving the the Brubaker Phillips um, Reckless books right now. Mm-hmm. You know they come out like pretty quickly and they're just like these self contained stories. You know, so right. I really enjoy that. I do have ideas for some stuff that I want to do. Like I love I would love to do. I have a a, a series in mind that I want to do. That's like every issue is a different story but there's like a, a a single element that sort of ties them all together very similar to what like michael walsh is doing with the silver coin if you guys are familiar with that i, um, I i've heard of it but i haven't had a chance to read it so yeah, yeah it's like the silver coin is just kind of like this rabbit's foot type of object that right you know it's like every story is a different thing and he actually has been pairing with different writers to to tell these one issue stories which is really cool Oh, cool. um, and the coin is the through line, right? So I right. have something very similar to that kind of setup that I like to do. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I really also like just getting to be able to put out this one thing, you know, you don't have to worry about sales attrition, like, <laughs> you know, cause like <laughs> it's a one-time purchase and, right. and, um, you know, uh, so yeah, as far as my third book, it's, it's probably too early to talk about just cause it's like, I'm, I'm still even trying to, you know, write it out. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I will say that it's like a, it's, you know, similar to count the way that it was like, a, um, you know, sort of a sci-fi fantasy thing, like, you know, not super hard sci-fi, not super hard fantasy, like, but you know, it's kind of a terrestrial sort of world. Um, right. but it's within this world, it's kind of like a Western type of story. Oh, so, cool. um, yeah, I'm really excited about it. I'm, I've been trying to write it for a couple of weeks now, but life keeps, gets, keeps getting in the way, but I'm, you know, I'm finally getting back on track with it. So um, hopefully that'll be out this time next year. And, you know, we can chat about that again. Episode three, well, episode Isn't three. That- yeah. <laughs> of, of the five series deal that we have yeah. with you. <laughs> yeah. Hey, speaking of, uh, you know, I read count last year, um, you know, before the interview, the PDF that you sent us and I loved it. And I've read this one. I can't wait to, um, pick up the like the 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 trade of retroactive because Thanks, I I don't know if you know this like the I mean you know you probably have copies of it yourself but like the count like paperback is like the one of the nicest books I've ever seen I mean they really did a great job didn't right? they like, though <laughs> yeah it's got the gatefold cover yeah. and the, yeah yeah I was really I was like pleased. blown away with yeah. it when I when I got it in the mail and I was like. Like a lot of times too, like um, when I get books in the mail, I'm always worried about like if it's a paperback, if it's going to get messed up or something. Yeah. And I was so happy that like when I opened that up, that like I looked at how nice it was and that thankfully it didn't get like folded up or yeah, like, jacked right. up. In the, in <laughs> Thanks, the, man. Yeah. I know that's always a toss up, right? Like is is the person who ships this going to like care about it enough mm-hmm. to not let it get all mangled? <laughs> is, is, the, is the mail person who delivers it like? 
throw right. it at your house. <laughs> like, Pull an you know. Ace Ventura on it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't have the, the uh, U S version of retroactive yet, but I got a French, a copy of the French version, which they have in hardcover. I wish they, we could do hardcovers mm-hmm. here, but, uh, and it printed really nicely. Like uh, Brad Simpson, the colorist texted me when he got his and he was like, dude, these colors came out great. I was like, I know, man, I, they really did you justice. So that's awesome. Um, yeah. Thanks, man. I'm, I'm excited uh, to, to have it in my hands, you know? Yeah. You know, it, it's funny that you bring that up because um, Kevin and I are thinking about doing a series uh, about the comics industry, calling it like comics 101 to talk about what the process is like with the editor and the writer and the artist and things like that. And somebody had mentioned to us on Twitter that we should really do something with uh, printing as well, too. And hearing you say that, it's like, you know, th- there might be something there to talk to people about, you know, how printing makes a difference, like what you're saying and and the process of that as well, too. So it's really interesting to hear how just the printing of the colors and the hard uh, the hardback cover and things like that, how that can make a world difference. I think that's really a genius way for the publisher to think about using the cover as a way to entice and attract readers that Mm -hmm. kind of makes it stick out a little bit more than the other ones that they may or may not be competing with. But I think that's a really smart idea for them to think about using something different for the cover as a way to pull people in. So that's, that's awesome. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot that goes into it. I mean, paper stock, you know, with, with the cover, with the interior, like, Mm -hmm. you know, what's, what's the cost versus, you know, the, the cost profit analysis on this, Mm -hmm. kind of paper versus that and right you know so i mean there's there's so much that goes into it that we just don't really think about because we don't have to you know right yeah do you have to think about like your page count when when that stuff comes up or yeah okay yeah i well i mean you know they they pretty much like like i'm i'm given a page count like it's basically like hey you know this we want to do 120 pages and i go okay that's the equivalent of six issues so i have it in my head generally like what that pace is out to be. And Mm -hmm. then, you know, uh, sometimes you get, I mean, both, I got really lucky both with, I mean, well, maybe it's just my, you know, uh, subconscious, like knowing it, I don't know, but, uh, with both count and retroactive, I came in like right at, I think, I think retroactive was 118 pages. Like by the time I had it all written out and then Mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, cool. That means I can like decompress this one scene a little bit. And then those are my two pages, you know, Right. So, cause I was, you know, sometimes you're worried like this is not enough. And other times you're like, Oh, this is gonna be too much. You know, <laughs> and I thought retroactive was going to be like way over. Cause it's, you know, got a lot going on, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I got lucky. It worked out. So it, is it one of those things where it has to be right at 120 or could it come in a little bit lower if you wanted yeah, it to? I mean, well, part of it is like what you're contracted for, you know, like, right. I mean, you, you know, usually, the, I mean, at least in my experience, like humanoids is cool. Like if I were to say, Hey, I think this is going to be 125 pages. Mm-hmm. It'd probably work with me, you know? Right. Um, but there's all, I have to be considerate of, of what they have agreed to pay me to write make the book. So, right. cause you know, anybody could just like pad it out. Like, ah, it's another 10 pages. Cause I want the extra money. Right. <laughs> um, but I think at this point, you know, like we have a good enough working relationship that, you know, they know that, you know, and also, I mean, really the, the, you know, with Mark Wade as the publisher and then, Mm-hmm. Uh, Rob Levin was the editor uh, that I was working with. He's at Valiant now, so now we have Jake Thomas from Marvel who came over to Humanoids, who I'm looking forward to working with on this third book. But you awesome. know, they're, those guys are all such experts that like, there's no way that I would ever find myself in a position to be like, what do I do? And one of them wouldn't be like, well, here's an idea, and we wouldn't get it to where it needed to be. You know, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it's a lot of it has to do with like, again, the cost profit analyses of like, you know, mm-hmm. what, what, how, what do people want to pay for how much comics, you know, right. like, you know, our past sales records show that if we put out, you know, a hundred pages at $20, that doesn't sell as well as 120 at 22 or whatever, you know what I mean? Right. So, right. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. There's a lot that like, like I said, we don't really have to consider until you're, you find yourself going, Oh, I got to like make this work, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Well, the same, at the same time, if you cut something out that would have been a big selling point to the book or, or, you know, like you have to, you know, you, let's say you add two pages and it makes the book a lot stronger word of mouth 
you know, about your book maybe becomes more stronger. So I'm sure that there's, there's a lot of like marketing costs that they have to like consider when they, when they do something like that. So, right. Hey, we're going to switch gears a little bit because last year uh, when you were on our show was the first time that we ever really like played a game with a guest. And oh, was that? I didn't realize that was the yeah. It was, that was the first time. It was just, game. Yeah, listen, yeah. it was like you were one of the first like I don't say big big name people that we interviewed, but you were one of the the people that um that well when we wrote out questions, we wrote out questions. We we're like, man, I don't know if this is this conversation is going to be enough time. So let me come up with this idea to like you know be oh, a filler sure, in yeah. case we need it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But like it was so good, it was so great what we did with you um, that we you know started playing games with some of the people that um, that we've interviewed, and we're going to mm-hmm. play a game tonight with you. And um, and, and if I can like. interject real quick, Kevin, mm-hmm. I, I want to share that. Uh, the game for part of our episodes has actually become a staple with our guests now that I've had people reach out to us when we didn't do a game for like someone that we had on the show, but wasn't an interview. Cause we usually do it for people we're interviewing, but we have guests on the show right. that we are not interviewing, but it's helping us like review a film or something like that. Mm-hmm. So I've had people reach out and say, Oh, you guys didn't do a game this time. And so I think our, our loyal listeners of seven <laughs> or however many we have are expecting a game every time we interview now. So it's been a staple and it really did start with you. So it's nice, nice. to do this game with you. <laughs> so oh, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, this game has a theme. Uh, you know, we, we talked last time about, we, we bonded over our shared love of, uh, of Superman for the quest for peace. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and this, since your book retroactive is about time travel, I decided I was going to come up with a game called, retro action where we travel back in time <laughs> to stop some of the worst action movies ever made from being unleashed on the world oh, so i love it you're gonna play against sean uh there's eight questions here uh they're there uh what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna describe uh, a film to you and i'm gonna show you the uh i'm gonna show you the poster but the the important stuff is gonna be like the words and stuff are gonna be um, blacked out Okay. And so if you're if you're listening to this podcast, go check out the YouTube video because there's there's more that you'll see there. But uh, I'm going to ask you a question, give you the description, ask you the question. If you can answer the question, I'm going to give you uh, I'm going to give you three points. If if you if you can get it before I give you the multiple choice, I'll give you three points. But I do have multiple choice (laughs) as well. So you can still get a point. Now, are uh, Kevin or are Sean and I trying to like buzz in on this, or is it no, like, no, no? I'm gonna, I'm okay. we're just gonna rotate. I'm gonna go to you okay. first, Ibrahim, Take and then turns. I'm gonna, then yep. I'm gonna go to Sean. Okay, so Ibrahim, your first question is: You'll have to travel back to 1997 to stop the launch of this much maligned action sequel starring Sandra Bullock and an often memed Willem Dafoe, but not Keanu Reeves. What is the the subtitle of Speed Two? Cruise Control, baby. That is correct. Not, not baby, but cruise control. Right. Yes, yeah. cruise control is correct. Yeah, that is... actually, I know this because my wife says, oddly enough, before we go on a cruise, this is her favorite movie to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of weird because they crashed the cruise ship. Yeah, in this that's movie. the worst possible. I mean, uh, unless she said the Poseidon Adventure was her favorite, <laughs> yeah. or Titanic, or Titanic, yeah. Yeah. the worst. Yeah, she she okay. says I just get the part when they crash the ship, but she loves it when she sees the the cruise ship and and the beach. Just gets her excited for it, and then she stops before it gets to the crashing part. <laughs> All right, I just, Sean. I just watched Speed the other night. By the way, um, oh yeah, holds up great movie yeah. <laughs> yeah it's it's on the list of like the movies that i need to watch with uh with madden as he gets older um so that he can get like an education because you know he he wants to be a <laughs> yeah. filmmaker and stuff like that so i, I want to show him all the good ones oh the, okay mm-hmm. i before you said that i was thinking like yeah you got to educate that boy on uh on, on, you know, <laughs> on how to make the greatest movies. action movies of the yeah. 90s and, yeah yeah well that too like he's got to he's got to know the good stuff yeah okay uh, while you're in 1997, Sean, hang uh-huh. around and stop this video game film sequel from being released and tarnishing the good name of the franchise. What is the subtitle to this Mortal Kombat sequel? Annihilation. Annihilation is correct. <laughs> Annihilation. Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Um, the worst thing from Mortal Kombat until the most recent Mortal Kombat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, Kevin and I did a review of that earlier this year, or yeah, this year, and uh, just talked how bad it was. Unfortunately, you know, it was it was terrible, and I loved it. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think for us, we we said it was terrible and we left it at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, it had, it started so strong. I don't yeah. want to derail the game, but man, I was, that was a bummer. I, there was a lot that I liked about it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, all in all, it was just like, how did you screw that up? Well, Kevin and I talked about the story between Sub Zero and Scorpion was so great that we really wish they'd do a spinoff of that because if they just did a movie just between those two, the storytelling the first 10 minutes was fantastic. Yeah, and then it's like yeah. you skipped out on the theater and went and, and saw a different movie, even though you're watching at home, you know, like yeah. wh- what am I watching now? So yeah, anyways. <laughs> All right, Ibrahim, it's back to you. You'll only have to go back to 2011 to find one of the Twilight teens trying to reshape his image into an action hero in this film about a young man who finds out he was abducted at birth. What is the name of this Taylor Lautner film? I can't remember off the top of my head. I'm going to have to go multiple choice on this one. All right, multiple choice options. Is it A, abduction, B, kidnapped, C, taken, or D, captive? A, abduction. A, abduction is correct. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> Very I, d- I didn't know either I, I had to see the list so but once i saw the list i was like oh i remember now so. i knew it was a single word thing yeah I yeah <laughs> i'm gonna be honest a lot of these i got from like um different articles about like the worst movies on um like rotten tomatoes and whatnot uh, uh-huh. yeah. um and this one's pretty low on there but yeah. i i remember seeing it years ago and thinking it wasn't it wasn't that bad now i mean i could watch it again and, and probably change my mind but like at the time <laughs> i was like it's, it's not that bad Right. Damn. I, I guess. I guess the world went Team Edward, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. Like, look. Look who got the like the <laughs> yeah. the longevity out of that. I mean, he yeah. had. Yeah. You know, he's one of them's Batman. Now. I mean, Pattinson's a fantastic actor. So that's mm-hmm. true. Yeah. All right, Sean, you're up next. All right. Bring your umbrella umbrella back to 1998 to stop this action disaster about an armored car heist set during a torrential flood. What is the name of this Christian Slater film? Um. Yeah. Now, let me ask you a question. If I guess and get it wrong, do I still get the multiple choice or does it go to Ibrahim? Uh, you can still, uh, I don't know. Abraham, oh, Abraham you got to let me steal it. You got to <laughs> let me steal it. <laughs> no, no. I, if that's the case, then I want the, I want the multiple choice. Cause I know I, I, if I see it, I will know what it is. It's okay. I'm going to show you the tongue. multiple choice. Yeah. Yeah, is it A, that. the flood? B, the vault. Hard rain. C, hard rain. Or D, the river wild. <laughs> what did you say, Sean? Hard rain. It is C, hard rain. Very good. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's a After, good movie, too. I really that, like that. I like that one a lot, too. Yeah. Uh, we just want the money. <laughs> underrated. <laughs> yeah. It's a really okay. good one. So halfway through, halfway through, you're tied at four points apiece. Okay. I'm glad right. you had to go multiple choice on that one because I was yeah. oh bro <laughs> ballistic X versus sever. Come on. Oh, you, didn't, now. you gotta let me you gotta let me <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> I got so excited. I got so excited. <laughs> Test your medal against two action film stars at the bottom of their careers. Travel back to um, so that should be t- 2002 to stop Antonio Banderas and Lucy Liu from making this ill-fated romp about warring hit persons. I didn't know like you know, hit men. Yeah. It's 2022. You guys say hit persons. <laughs> yeah. What right. is the name of this film? You already knew it. It is Ballistic X versus Sever. You know, I've never seen this movie because it's not streaming anywhere. And mm-hmm. actually, my friend and I tried to watch it. We watched uh, the the Charlie's Angels movies recently mm-hmm. like yeah. via via you know Google Hangout or whatever while we were working. Mm-hmm. And we were like, dude, we should watch X versus Sever. Because we also watched The Mask of Zorro, which is a perfect movie and one of my top five all-time favorites oh yeah <laughs> and uh and lucy lou what a babe so let's do it and then it wasn't anywhere so no quite kidding. a bummer. well and the fact that it takes place like this year would be awesome to watch now and see how much they got right and how much they got wrong now right <laughs> well I, that's a typo in the in the in the game i don't you were supposed to have it proofread, Kevin. I know. I did. Look, <laughs> we talked about. You know what? I did. I did watch a. Uh, I watched a movie not too long ago that I'd seen before, but it's called Repo Men. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, the one with uh, Forrest Whitaker and Jude Law. Have mm-hmm. you guys seen that? And uh, it was like a Universal movie, I want to say. And so they had a they had a Fast and the Furious like eight or six or something in the background because it took place in the future. And I was like, damn, they got one thing, right? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, here we go, Sean. Your your next one. All right. 
You'll be electrified if you don't travel back to 2015 to stop this action drama centered around a family of hardworking power linemen trying to restore an electrical grid during a deadly storm. What is the name of this John Travolta film? Uh, no idea. Just, I've never even heard of this movie. <laughs> I've never seen the poster. Like, I, yeah, this. OK, just give me the multiple choice. And let me see if I can guess here. Is it the lineman? Is A, the lineman, B, <laughs> power storm, C, power line down, or D, life on the line? Uh, I'm going to go with power storm. The correct answer is D, life on Ooh. the line. Uh, so no I, for that was that anyone's one. guess, man. I, I know. <laughs> Look, you know it, and, tr- it's, and it's still coming soon, too. <laughs> I tried to make sure, too, that like all of these films got a um, like a wide release so that there was, was no like... Um, you know, like Bruce Willis direct to video, like hidden oh, gems. Oh yeah, in there. yeah. This but actually made it to the theaters. This actually made it to the theaters. I've never seen anything about this. That's so strange. When did it come out? 2015. Okay, gotcha. All right, Ibrahim. Here's one for you. You can't stop Nicolas Cage from making all of his bad movies, <laughs> but you can go after him in the one that sees him star as a hitman in town to pull off a series of jobs while falling for a local woman and bonding with his errand boy. What is the name of this 2008 film? I have seen this movie. I believe it takes place in Thailand. I believe it is Bangkok Dangerous. The correct answer is Bangkok Dangerous. Very nice. good. Nice. Excellent work. And I got now, the John Travolta life <laughs> line on the down or down on whatever it was. <laughs> That's how memorable life that on the line. <laughs> yeah. I like how we had a little face off back to back there. And this, exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was on purpose. I rearranged them after the fact. You know like, what kind of threw me on this together. though, too? I couldn't think of the name at first. And I saw the, the butt of the gun or the, the handle yeah. peeking out from under the black thing. And I was like, it doesn't look like part of a D. So I could be wrong, but <laughs> yeah. Um, go ahead, Sean. Did you? Have uh, a I was going. No, I was going to say. Um, it's funny that you mentioned Face Off because in the Adam Project there was a call out to Face Off where somebody in the classroom was wearing a, I think a uh, Nicholas Cage like a sweater with Nicholas Cage face on it. It says, "I'm John Travolta." Yeah, I, I caught that too. It was pretty great. Awesome. It was great. Yeah, it was really good. <laughs> Okay, last one, Sean. Uh, yeah. You can't win, but you can at least get some credibility. Oh, my gosh. I, I had a winning streak, and then I've just been losing time and time again. Okay. Well, I fine. knew that I knew that Ibrahim would be a like would be a big fan of like um cheesy action movies. Oh yeah. yeah. So and I the, kind of like, the hard one. I kind of like put this right in his wheelhouse. And I used to work in a video store, so yeah. See? <laughs> All right, this 1986 film must be stopped from using every action movie trope that you can imagine. Rogue cop, check. Grocery store shootout, check. Chase scenes with a semi truck, check. Horrendous one liners, check. What is the name of this Sylvester Stallone film? Yeah, this one you got to give me the multiple choice because it's, I'm sure if I saw it, I probably know what it is. Is it A, Fair Game, B, Cobra, C, The Hunter, or D, The Night Slasher? Is it Cobra? It is B, yeah, Cobra. Baby. Nice. His name in that movie is like something Cobretti. Yeah. Cobra. I don't remember his first name, like, and they call him Cobra. Yeah, <laughs> like Snake actually, and Kurt Russell in Escape from yeah. LA <laughs> or Escape from New York. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, with a final score of uh, ten to five, Ibrahim is the winner of retro Good job. action. <laughs> thank you, thank you. That was a fun what, game. What video store did you work at? Uh, I don't know if I think it was Nationwide Hollywood Video. Did you all have? Oh that? yeah, oh yeah, okay. I had one. Yeah. yeah. I actually worked at Family Video for about six months. Yeah. Oh, we've, yeah, got, something, was... we've got something in oh, common, guys. Snap. Oh, I still snap. have my badge from Blockbuster Video. Man, I we so at Hollywood, we had to wear purple button-up shirts with like an embroidered Hollywood video insignia right here. Yeah, yeah. And then we had like a lanyard, like a con badge with our name in it. It had like a, one of those like movie slate, you know, graphics. Mm-hmm. Like the clapperboard, yeah. Yeah. And I remember it was like a busy Friday and I Friday night and I was on my lunch break and I was like, let me just get to the office with my food that I just gone to pick up. And this guy stops me. He's like, "Uh, excuse me, do you work here? 
And I looked down at my outfit and I went, <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 oh man, that was such a great job. So much yeah. fun. Yeah. 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 It was I, a fun job. I loved my time at the video store. Um, I mean, minus the like management that knew far less about movies than I did, but, <laughs> but I that mean, was I the guess... cool thing about my, I'm still friends with my manager today. Like, Oh, nice. Was, nice. You know, 20 years ago that I worked there. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, when I worked at family video, the weird thing about working there is that they told me I had to shave my goatee, which is not a good look when you also have a shaved head. And so I was like very adamantly against it, but they said that that was only real requirement they had for males working there was the facial family. Hair. Yeah, because like, a family. Yes. Yeah. But then I pointed out to him, I was like, but you guys have a porn section in the back. And he's like, man, I don't make the rules. <laughs> like, okay, you can keep the mustache. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, I always thought that was weird. It's just like, because it's, yeah. you got to have the family image, but you still have that. Like, okay. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah. Video stores, like, maybe that should be the next, maybe that's where the setting of your next book, Ibrahim, set it in a, in a <laughs> oh, video man. store. I, yeah, I could, that'd be, I don't know. Has there ever been a, we need a, like a, a, a good, like, office style TV show that takes place <laughs> in a video store, you know? <laughs> The last the thing one is, on is the like planet. With, like yeah. all the all the kids these days, like I don't get this. I can't relate to this at all. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's wild is like that used to be a Friday night, right? Friday, Saturday oh, yeah. night. Like you would go to the video store. And it was like, I always thought, I mean, because I worked there when Netflix was just starting to become a thing. Mm-hmm. Same. And I yeah, and I just remember thinking, like, I would tell people, like, I don't think it's going anywhere. Like, uh, because <laughs> this is like an outing for people. You yeah. know, it's a way you can, you can go and do so the whole family can get in the car, go somewhere. You don't even have to put real pants on, you know, people will show up in their pajamas all the time. Like, right. And you can have a family experience for $5, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, yeah. so I thought it would, I thought it would stick around, but then, you know, yeah, I think streaming is what changed the game for them because Absolutely. we did the, yeah. we did the mail and DVD for a while, but then when, once they started streaming, it really changed how people yeah. started, uh, consuming the entertainment and everything like that so yeah that's what you're, you're making me nostalgic and sad like that i'm never going to be able to take my kids to a video store and be like all right guys you get to pick something out <laughs> yeah they, i mean depending on where you live there are still some yeah. here and there that you know mm-hmm. they're like little independent mom and pop kind of things that are like you know we have I have, we have like one or two here in portland obviously because it's portland but right you might have to mm-hmm. go to austin to my kids have been to the red yeah my kids have been to the red box. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. The red box. Oh my gosh. Yeah. As well, a matter you... of fact, like we live fairly close to a Walgreens that has a red box. Mm-hmm. And then, I mean, the red box really hasn't been the same since like the pandemic. Right. Because like literally everything is available on streaming right. around the same time as it's on, on Blu-ray. Yeah. Um, but like we can literally walk to the, to the red box from here. So maybe I'll do that now that we're on spring break, take the, <laughs> take the kids over to the red box and pick something out. Yes. Yeah. Nice. You know, what's funny is uh, Blockbuster and all the video rental places around where I live went down, except family video hung out until maybe two years ago. Then that's when they started fighting the oh, dust. Wow. But I was like, of all places, it kind of makes sense because family video was always lower rates than all the other places, which is why people love going there. Um, but I was just so surprised how long they held out because I could have sworn that they would have gone out with all the other places, but sure enough, they, they stayed around until probably, I think the pandemic probably put them out of business. So, yeah, that's wild. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Oh no. It was really weird because there was like three around where I live and I'm like, why this many? Cause it's in within like a one square mile of our house and wow. Yeah. Did you, did you ever go to them or? Uh, we did a few times, but not not that much. I think I forget what my wife would remember, but we went there to get some movies like every once in a while, probably something had just come out, maybe like Disney or something like that that we want to watch and try out. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, it was years since we went back. So, yeah, because yeah, again, because of streaming. So, right. Yeah. This this episode of the caption life was a lot like an episode of The Simpsons, like where it started versus where it ended. Is, <laughs> <Yeah>. is... <laughs> the one that was about this is also the one that's about that. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. That's weird that we had all that, that all in common. 
Yeah. Um, hey, Abraham, thank you again for coming on the show. Before we let you go today, uh, let everybody know where they can find you and your work online, especially where they can uh, order uh, Retroactive. Yes. Uh, so if you go to retroactivecomic.com, uh, you can pre-order the book from one of several places. Basically, it's one link. Uh, you click it, and then it gives you like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and a link to Comic Shop Locator, where you can find the nearest comic shop to you. Um, and then there's also a trailer for the book uh, that I put together that's on that site as well. Um, I'm running a pre-order giveaway. So anyone who pre-orders it can email retroactivecomic at gmail.com uh, mm -hmm. with their like you know screen cap of their receipt. Uh, or, you know, proof of purchase or whatever. And um, we'll be entered to win like one of several prizes. I got t-shirts, signed book plates, um, signed comics, original art, the whole shebang. So um, that's right. Drift chamber. Yeah. Yeah. The watch, you know. Um, and then uh, there's, there should be links to my social media stuff on there as well. So you can also go to IbrahimMustafa.com and all my, uh, you know, stuff is up there. So. Awesome. we'll make sure to put that in the show notes too thank you yeah and that wraps up another episode of the caption life we hope you enjoyed listening don't forget to smash that subscribe button on whatever major podcast platform you listen to us on you can also follow us on twitter and instagram at caption life if you like what we're doing give us a shout out tag us in your post for more info about us and all of our previous episodes please visit the captionlife.com until next time go check out retroact peace out <laughs>